You're listening to The Ecoside Report, a monthly podcast from Stop Ecoside International and the Movement for Ecoside Law. Stop Ecoside International is working tirelessly to get Ecoside recognized by the International Criminal Court, but we need your help. If you value this content or want to support the work of Stop Ecoside International, you can become a patron over at patreon.com for just one hour's wage per month. Your support makes our work possible and we can't thank you enough. Hello everyone, welcome to episode six of the Ecoside Report. Um, My name is Chidi Oti Obihara and today we come to you from the Royal Society uh, on John Adams Street in London. I'm here with my good friend, Jojo Mehta. Hi Chidi, great to be here again and so much to update on in this episode. I think it's gonna be a bit of a packed one. So today is very full, I'm not even sure where to start. There have been quite a few happenings in quite a few countries. Jojo, where did you want to focus on for this episode? I think what's been really striking over the last few weeks is seeing how many um, governments, how many national governments are beginning to engage in this conversation sort of at the domestic level. Um, and that's, that's interesting because it kind of, you know, it sort of shows that the international, the national, the regional, all of these levels are kind of, um, they're sort of mutually reinforcing. There's a kind of entrainment effect happening. Um, so just... To, you know, to put that into the picture, um, there have been domestic proposals of ecocide law in a number of countries just in the last couple of months, since the beginning of June. So um, one was in, was in Brazil, um, and that was at the beginning of June, um, and followed various discussions around um, the, the, the Amazon protection of the Amazon, the indigenous uh, role in protecting the Amazon. So it's, it's good to see a proposal actually being put forward um, into the parliament in Brazil. Um, obviously, the situation there is that there's a, a dominance in the Congress and the Senate of supporters of Bolsonaro. So we don't know exactly what the you know, rocky road that that bill might take. Um, could be, um, but it's very encouraging to see that that's now part of the discussion there, and that also gives social movements and uh, NGOs and others something to point to and gather around and and really build up momentum around. Secondly, there are further developments in Belgium, um, which, as we know, has been uh, in the kind of procedural stages of legislating for ecocide. Um, and you know the next stage of that has now um, been accomplished in the sense that the government has you know concretely put forward its reforms for the uh, penal code there, um, and they do include ecocide. Um, it still needs to have parliamentary approval, so it's not quite at the final stage of the process. Um, but that's also you know a very encouraging step. I mean because of the legal setup in Belgium, which is uh, between sort of federal level at the sort of government level, but also regional level, um, the the law in Belgium would cover certain aspects and not others because some are in the competency of the regions. But it nonetheless shows that there's a strong sort of direction, a, you know, step in the right direction, um, and an acknowledgement that the eco side must be recognised, and that's obviously very positive. We've also seen a a proposal of law in the Netherlands from the Party for the Animals, which one might perhaps describe as the Deep Green Party um, in in the Netherlands. Um, That's been worked on for a number of months now, and it was put forward in July. Um, So that is also now beginning its journey. They've just uh, had a consultation for a few weeks there, and it will now uh, move forward to being discussed by the Council of State. And obviously, there's a a longer process before it comes to parliamentary approval, but again, part of the the, um, process. Um, And and two more countries. I mean, this is extraordinary. This is, you know, five countries that have had significant developments um, in in just the last few weeks. So another is Spain, where the regional um, parliament of Catalonia has set in motion the process that will ultimately bring um, you know, a, a, an ecocide proposal to the national parliament. Obviously, it starts at the regional level. Um, so that's also been launched um, in July. Um, and finally, uh, Mexico, um, literally just last week, I believe. Um, so one of the 
de uh, deputy, the MPs in, in Mexico, has put forward a, an ecocide law bill uh, there to the national parliament, the federal parliament, um, which is very closely based on the international definition that came out of the expert panel in 2021. And indeed, there's been um, a kind of theme here where those who are legislating nationally or who are looking to you know, move those, those um, bills forward at the national level, um, those proposals have all been, to, to varying degrees, based around the international definition. So it gives us a real sense of what a catalyst that global definition is. And for anybody who is new to that, it's very simple at its core, and it's ecocide law, or ecocide means rather, um, unlawful or wanton acts committed with the knowledge that there's a substantial likelihood of severe and either widespread or long-term damage to the environment being caused by those acts. Which of course indicates intent, which of course makes it criminal, which is why it's so important. Well, that's excellent, that's quite the tour de force if you think about it. This arc of going, and you did, almost in a sort of pedestrian way, um, from Europe via Spain into, into Mexico. Would it be fair to say that um, we're at a potential tipping point where the Spanish-speaking world are, are yielding uh, uh, an interest in, in criminalizing ecocide broadly across South America? I think there is certainly interest in many of the South American countries, yes. And we have civil society campaigns that are quite active in a number of countries, including Chile, including Argentina, for example, um, Brazil. And, and so we are seeing the conversation becoming very much a part of the political landscape. I mean, there's a way to go, but it's, 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 taking, it's taking root. Brazil is unique and different for a whole bunch of reasons. And we will talk about Belém at some point, probably not now. Um, but also in July, there's the Parliamentary Assembly for the Organization of Security and Cooperation um, in Europe. Os, os? OSCE, I think, I think it's known as. Um, so yeah, it's, it's the biggest intergovernmental sort of security organization in, in the world in the sense that it's got 57 member states. Um, and so this is sort of, in a sense, at the regional level kind of follows on from support at the European Parliament in March, very concretely, uh, you know, approving a text to go into the EU directive on protection of the environment through criminal law. And then shortly before that, the Council of Europe also putting a resolution and a recommendation through almost unanimously recommending its member states to legislate for ecocide nationally and internationally. So we're seeing a theme here where the recommendations coming through are for domestic, regional, and international levels. So there's this, there's this sense that, um, that it's something that needs recognizing both at the domestic government level, which is of course where enforcement normally happens, um, but also at the international level. And what that then recognizes is the severity, the seriousness of mass harm to nature. Um, and so having the, uh, having the OSCE assembly recognizing that and, and recommending that as well is yet another level of, of, of regional support. So that's also very exciting. Well, speaking of regional support, um, you, you attended a Congress of Greens in North Korea? <laughs> Not North Korea, no. Um, it, it was in the Republic of Korea. Um, yes, the Global Greens, um, it's actually members, of, uh, representatives of Green parties from all over the world, uh, gathered um, in the suburbs of Seoul uh, in, um, in June. Yeah, indeed. And, uh, and yeah, I was present there. Um, with, there was a panel dedicated around, around ecocide law. And actually, a, a resolution emerged from that Congress, you know, which only meets every five years, but they, they, they come out with a series of resolutions of you know, what the sort of Greens all around the world are going to be helping to move forward. And it, there was a very strong endorsement of the initiative to criminalize ecocide and an encouragement you know, for all of those representatives to go back to their own parliaments and actually push for that. Outstanding. And I, I mentioned North Korea, um, um, obviously accidentally, but it would be really interesting to find out if these ideas are percolating across all of the peninsula. All of well, it would be very interesting to know. We haven't had any word yet. <laughs> Fingers crossed. Um, and so you said there was a, a, a comprehensive endorsement statement that came out. Do you want to talk a bit more detail about that? Yeah, the resolution very specifically endorsed the uh, Stop Ecocide international movement and, and definition and so on. Um, so that was, oh, that was very encouraging. Um, and what it means, and this is something that... <laughs> 
I think maybe unique to the Greens, but, but what's interesting is that there's then a kind of global comprehensive kind of policy movement. And I'm not sure whether that actually happens with other political parties. It seems to be something that is specifically, um, there's a kind of coherence in the way that the Greens approach things globally um, that I think is, you know, makes an endorsement at that level quite powerful. 100%. No, I think that's a really important observation because I, there are many of us in the, in the political arena who keep on reflecting on the fact that there should be a huge amount of cross-party, cross-regional support for many of these things because I think there are limits to how political you can make it. Something as obvious and core to humanity's existence as preserving the home that you live in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's not like... <laughs> It's kind of insane, really. I mean, you know, destroying nature should be a crime. It's like, oh, you know, you're a left winger, you're a right, or you're a right winger. I mean, you know, it does, just doesn't make sense. And actually, I would say that, you know, in our current global political climate, there is, you know, it really helps to identify issues that don't polarize because there are so many that do. Um, and actually, you know, destruction of nature is something that we can all see happening. And it's actually an area where left and right often do um, actually come to agreement. So that's a, that's a really useful thing. Okay, well, well talking, about, talking about creating a sort of a post-ideological approach to green policy, so going beyond left and right, I think the crucible of, you know, place where this is happening has got to be Portuguese-speaking Brazil. It's, it's, you know, it's, it's influence over Amazonia, the lungs of the world is so pivotal. We've seen so much political change there. And we've seen two Berlin conferences there. But within the context of understanding how people have changed there, what progress is happening there, because it's a very, um, I think, sort of crucial place, isn't it, within which to discuss ecocide? I think so, and it's complex. You know, it's by no means you know, as straightforward as, great, someone's put in an ecocide law proposal, everything's going to be all right. Well, frankly, it's not going to be that simple. As you say, there has just been um, a conference in the city of Belém in Brazil, and there will be another towards the end of the month. Um, the one that's just happened was a regional gathering of the um, ACTO, which is the group of eight uh, Amazon countries, you know, as in countries that, that have territory, um, within the region of the Amazon forest and basin. Um, and one of the aims, or at least we had understood that one of the aims of that conference was to emerge with protective measures around the Amazon. Now, the declaration that emerged from that conference had well over 100 articles um, and somehow managed to avoid actually promising to stop deforestation by 2030, which was one of the things that was very much hoped for. So that did not materialize. Um, there, are also, there also was no completely concrete commitment about avoiding fossil fuel extraction, new fossil fuel extraction projects. So it, it was by no means a perfect um, outcome. Um, I mean, there were a number of positive steps outlined in, in that declaration. Um, that's a lot of articles to try and materialize, you know, without a couple of very, very key um, aspects that would have been good. Um, just prior to it, actually, uh, Chief Rowney, um, who's quite possibly the world's most you know, best known indigenous advocate for the protection of the earth and the Amazon in particular, um, held a gathering where there were seven, eight hundred um, people present, delegations from indigenous groups from all around Brazil. Um, and they did put forward something to that summit. Um, and it would be nice to be able to say that that was, you know, acknowledged in the right way in the outcome of the summit, but we're not convinced that it has been. Um, that said, those gatherings are of huge importance for actually bringing together the indigenous voices, and that is something that Stop Ecoside International is very supportive of. Um, we had representation there, um, and also there was um, uh, the presence of a, a colleague who has been putting together an amazing film um, that is uh, Get Bruch from Planet Amazon who has been working with Princess Esmeralda of Belgium putting together a wonderful documentary called Amazonia, the heart of Mother Earth uh, looking at um, what is happening out in Brazil and in the Amazon and advocating for you know, legal ways to protect 
the rainforest. Um, and in, in, in particular, um, the demarcation of indigenous territories, because it is very clear when we look at the mapping that where those territories have been demarcated and therefore you know, they have been protected, they are then not able to be invaded in the same way. So um, that's incredibly important. And also, of course, talking about ecocide law and how that can um, protect the, the ecosystems, but also protect those who stand up to defend them, not least by shifting the whole narrative around that. Because of course, what we often see with environmental defenders, often indigenous standing up against invasive industry is that they are framed as uh, almost framed as criminals, interrupting legitimate business activity, which is a sad indictment of the way that our law system prioritizes things. And so ecocide law um, is a, a sort of simple intervention in that system, if you like, which is, is actually completely in line with the system as it is, but which actually totally reframes that. It's because once you move the question mark from you know, over the heads of the, the protesters, the defenders, if you like, to the business activity itself, so that those industries are actually saying, well, actually, are we you know, in, on the right side of this law? You know, could, could we be uh, committing ecocide? Already, you have completely shifted that narrative, and those people become the moral upholders of the law, and that's fundamentally important. And that film is going to be doing the festival rounds um, next year, um, and it, there's been one or two private screenings of it, which is what's allowed at this stage, um, but it's a really um, passionate and uh, really engaging and galvanizing um, story and telling of what is happening in, in the Amazon. And yeah, we, we very much look forward to continuing to support that and to, yeah, to, to helping that make its way in the world and make the impact it needs to make. That's excellent. I, I, think, I think to, to, to frame that, um, appropriately, you made, I thought, a very powerful point about the fact that Earth Defenders are called that, mm. not just because of the cultural, social, and economic defense that they offer to the natural living habitats that they occupy, but also the political and sometimes military defense of those realms. Um, Earth Defenders are frequently portrayed not just as enemies of progress, but enemies of the political economy, enemies of jobs, enemies of, enemies of industry. And I suppose there's a spectrum. Okay, so at one end of the spectrum, there's a sort of a, a cold or smoldering resentment against Earth Defenders. But if you push the spectrum all the way to the other end, you get to acts of war, you get to acts of aggression that deliberately... murders, and so on, yeah. And you get to industrial levels of that, where you get deliberate destruction of the natural habitat in order to um, uh, demoralize uh, and, you know, in air quotes, defeat the people who live there. I'm now heading into Ukraine, as you can tell. Mm -hmm. um, the challenges we've seen with the demolition of the dam there and accusations I've seen in the mainstream press of ecocide and the context of understanding that you can have ecocide you know, in a spectrum of situations, both from seemingly peacetime industrial mm -hmm. growth. It, it isn't for people who live there, it does feel like war, all the way through to formal declarations of war and the targeting of nature yeah. in order to, to um, subdue the other side. Did you want to talk about that? I think that's absolutely relevant and it's becoming a more and more important part of this discussion because of what's been happening in, the, in Ukraine. Um, and the, uh, the description of the destruction of the Novokokovka Dam as an ecocide has really kind of brought home what ecocide might mean to so many countries and particularly, of course, to Europe, of course, as this is on the European doorstep. Um, and that's hugely important. And Ukraine is becoming a really um, major player in this discussion. And I think that's very interesting because, you know, in wartime, it's often understandably the direct damage to the, whether it's civilian casualties, whether it's damage to infrastructure, whether it's um, th those kinds of um, very immediate damages that are focused on first and foremost, and, and understandably so. But the situation you have with eco ecological destruction during conflict is that 
that damage can sometimes last both way beyond the conflict in time, but also way beyond the borders in terms of space. So um, there's something that is, and, and um, the Ukraine prosecutor's office had just been quoted in the New York Times um, as saying, you know, ecology, the environment is, is, is often the silent victim mm. of, of conflict. And what is also interesting here is that Ukraine and indeed Russia are, are, is a country that has some form of ecocide provision in its penal code already. Um, and so they, they are certainly looking into the possibility of building a case around ecocide using existing law. There is also a clause in the Rome Statute already under war crimes which could potentially cover the environmental destruction during wartime, although it's a difficult clause to prosecute and that's never been done before. But what's interesting is that Ukraine is being very vocal about being able to focus on ecocide as a standalone crime. In other words, it's very supportive of the international initiative to criminalize ecocide in its own right. Um, and that is really because um, even the laws that exist, although you know, they give some provision to be relied on, there's no real acknowledgement that destroying the environment to that degree in and of itself is bad, wrong, and dangerous. And that is something that, you know, ecocide as a standalone crime could really acknowledge. And of course, that then takes it into much broader applicability, um, which is so important. It's important to be able to address the most severe harms wherever and whenever they occur. Not, uh, you know, it's all very well to happen to be somewhere where there might be some provision that's usable, but of course most of the world is not in that position. And so I think what we're seeing here with Ukraine is actually a sort of generosity of spirit actually, um, and you know, a willingness to stand in a place that says nobody should suffer this. Um, and I think that that is also, um, that is echoed in the climate space by Vanuatu. Um, you know, also um, this, this Pacific Island Republic that is absolutely at the mercy of the effects of climate change, but is not sitting there saying, you know, poor us. Um, of course they're looking for aid, of course they're looking for help, but they're also saying, look, you guys, this is going to affect the rest of the world. And, you know, as we were, you know, we've, we've spoken about on other occasions, um, the, the reach of the effects of of climate change is not going to only be about small islands. It's also going to be about coastal cities all around the world. You know, all of this is, is absolutely relevant and I think really makes sort of heroes of these countries which are victims because they're actually willing to step up and say, this is an issue the whole world needs to consider because it's going to affect everybody. Absolutely correct. Well, I, I, think, I think that the, the relevance of understanding the impact of our climate ecological emergency on things like rising sea levels, the impact on small island states, and the impact on global capitals is that you start to see that um, you know, the ocean ecocide movement becomes even more important. Um, you start to see that the way that people relate to marine habits, so habitats, um, as relate to those, those cities who are on, literally on the edge during this process. Um, start to increase in importance. Now, I, I know that you're involved in a launch with Sylvia Earle in New York. That's right. So um, I think you're absolutely right that the marine ecosystems, habitats, the actual focus on the ocean at all has been very much neglected in the overall picture around climate change, also around um, ecological breakdown, it tends to be the area of nature, if you like, that's talked about the least, which is ironic, because of course we're on um, a, a blue planet, um, and actually it's the ocean that is the biggest climate regulator. So it's actually hugely important, and that aspect of the global movement has now got a, its own network, if you like, Ocean for, for Ecocide Law, um, that's had a number of events this year, and it had its official launch in New York with a wonderful conversation between Sylvia Earle and John Vermilia, um, and that was a, a really yeah, a really auspicious start to that conversation in particular. Um, and that's going to be growing, and part of that is going to emerge in an event in Trinidad at the beginning of September. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's a question of, you know, taking this conversation to those communities where, um, you know, where the marine environment is, is absolutely key. And that's, that's one of the things on the, on the agenda going forward. Excellent, excellent. So we've, this has been incredible because we've rushed now all the way through Developments in June, July, August, and September. 
um, chronologically speaking. We are now heading into October, and there's the European Crime Directive trialogues. Oh, that's right. So the uh, European Crime Directive is currently under discussion between the European Parliament representatives, the uh, Commission and the Council, and that's called a trilogue discussion. Um, and so those, there's legal technical discussions and political discussions ongoing. And the, the concluding political discussions are due to happen in early October. So we can look at seeing what is going to emerge from that at that stage. Now, we know that the, the Parliament has been quite um, vociferous in wanting um, the severe, widespread and long-term irreversible harms to be addressed in that directive. Um, obviously, we don't know what text will ultimately emerge from that, but we, we do know that it is going to be a step in some way in the right direction. But I'd also like to backtrack a little bit into September because, of course, you know, the second half of September is very important in the climate and ecological space in terms of uh, the high-level week at U the UN General Assembly in New York um, and, in parallel, the New York Climate Week, um, which both happen in the um, second half of September. Um, and we shall certainly be uh, taking part in a number of events there, including the Global Futures Conference being held at the Javits Centre. Um, which uh, Vanuatu will also be making an intervention in. Um, there's also a panel around international criminal law and the Amazon that I will be um, joining uh, on the 18th. Um, and there are a number of other uh, aspects in the planning, including there will be a, a, a major mobilization in March on the 17th, I believe, of September, which uh, is because I will also be a part of. So, you know, at, at all levels, there will be participation um, in New York Climate Week. And then moving forward, um, we're going to have a presence at the Arctic Circle Assembly in Iceland in October. So, I, you know, I realised that we're, being already in October, we've actually, I'd like to rewind a bit to September because there are a couple of key things happening then. So at the beginning of September, there's Africa Climate Week. We'll have a presence there. Um, and that's very important. The Africa conversation is really beginning to take off now. Um, we have a wonderful coordinator there, uh, lawyer James Gondi, um, and we've been working on um, bringing the conversation into a number of arenas. In particular, it seems to be taking root in the human rights sphere in Africa, and that is perhaps not surprising um, when we look at the uh, sort of instances of ecocidal activity, they often have a very strong impact um, in terms of human rights, human rights violations, impacts on communities and so on. So that is not surprising. Um, but the Africa Commission on Human and People's Rights session um, through May of this year, um, with the summary coming out, um, I believe the beginning of June, um, there was an acknowledgement specifically of ecocide law and how African states should take note of that and consider legislation. So there is, there is now a real kind of, um, you know, a beginnings of a, a strong engagement um, in Africa in that conversation. So that's going to be an important um, forum. Um, and then, of course, moving forward to the second half of September, um, we, we move the focus over to New York because that's where the UN General Assembly is and it's where the high-level week happens, 17th uh, to the 22nd, I think. Um, and also New York Climate Week, which runs in parallel, where you know, so many uh, representatives, so many NGOs, so many politicians, so many people uh, convening um, from the kind of climate world and the um, environmental world to, to, to bring all of these discussions to the fore. Um, and we will be taking active part in, the new, in those, those sessions. Um, for example, um, we'll, we'll be joining the Global Futures Conference, uh, the Javits Center, Vanuatu will also be joining that. Um, um, I'll also be speaking at um, a panel um, organized by the Observatorio de Clima um, from Brazil uh, around international criminal law. Um, and there will be other events too. Um, we are hoping to do a panel around the Amazonia film that we mentioned earlier with um, indigenous contribution as well, of course, to that event. Um, and also uh, other civil society input as well. Uh, we believe there's going to be a large march on the 17th um, and Stop Ecoside will have involvement in that as well. So at every level, um, there will be participation uh, in New York in September. 
We will then be moving forward. I'm going to jump back over October and move forward to November and December, just very broad strokes at the moment, because I'm sure we'll be speaking again before that. But of course, COP28 will be taking place in Dubai. We are still awaiting um, a notification of whether we are able to run a pavilion there um, and in, to focus on legal avenues to address climate change, which is very, very important to bring that into the discussion in as many ways as possible. Um, waiting to hear about a side event there too. Um, and of course, the uh, Assembly of States Parties of the International Criminal Court also happens in December. This year, that is taking place in New York, and we will certainly be um, running event, if not more than one, in that uh, context as well. So what we're seeing is um, effectively a kind of momentum gathering at, in the, throughout the, the, you know, the year through these various events. And ultimately moving towards, um, you know, really engaging numbers of states within this conversation at the International Criminal Court. In other words, that, that, that global conversation, which is now, of course, supported by the fact that so many domestic governments are taking up this conversation. It's all mutually reinforcing, which is very important. Absolutely. Well, the, the other minor thing which might get edited out of this video um, is the fact that Turkey, of course, called force majeure. Um, on its ability to hold COP16 um, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so this, this idea of where the, the next global um, conference uh, of parties on biodiversity, where it gets hosted, mm -hmm. is up in the air. Um, it's an interesting sort of point juncture, I think, to reflect again on the base principles of what Stop Ecosystem International stands for and how that intersects with conferences about biodiversity, where they're held, what this indicates to the world. Do you have any preferences, thoughts? I think it's um, understandable that Turkey's decided it can't manage to host um, the COP16 of the Convention on Biological Diversity, um, which it would have been hosting next year. As I understand it, there are no other bids at the moment to host that. I mean, I think it would be very interesting to consider potentially having it hosted. I mean, I think it has to be hosted somewhere in Western Europe. Um, you know, it might be an opportunity for the UK to step up, who knows. Um, but it's certainly an important conference in terms of uh, ecocide law, because often ecocide is perhaps the most easily understood in the context of the destruction, the direct destruction of ecosystems. And that is very much in the arena of um, ecology, biodiversity, all of those topics that come up in, in, those conf in that conference particularly. So, you know, we're you know, definitely watching that space with interest. Well, thanks for saying that. It's super important. I, I think another super important observation to make, and this has been going on in policy circles now for a couple of years, is that whenever we try to solve a problem, a mass pollution problem or, or other challenge to um, uh, uh, human environmental health created by industry, whenever we try and solve these problems, we've always done in the past, we've always stopped creating the pollutant, stopped doing the damage, and then simply waited for nature to heal itself. So whether it's lead in petrols or DDT in the 1960s or 70s, um, whether it's uh, 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 the ozone layer and CFCs, or in fact now, whether it's excessive carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, all humanity's ever been able to do is to stop polluting stop causing the damage, and then try and wait patiently for nature to clear up our mess. So if we're at a point, at a juncture, where global deforestation is running at 12% of you know, humanity's carbon footprint, where ecocide damage is actually happening so rapidly, we need to outwardly voice the fact that damaging nature, including especially episodes of ecocide, are stopping us solving the other bigger problems that we've created in the atmosphere around us. And it's a really important, I think, for this to be the first degree fight, the first point of defense, the first thing we need to do is to protect and restore nature. Absolutely, I mean, I think, I think what, what you're highlighting really is that we actually need to put something in place that deters, mm. so that we're not just trying to clear up after the fact or you know, stop something that's in motion. We actually want to put a law in place that will prevent the destructive action being taken in the first place. Um, you know, because ultimately, of course, that is what criminal law is about. Murder is a law to stop people killing each other. You know, it's as simple as that. So, you know, that's what we need to 
it, that's how we need to see this, and that's the context in which we need to see this. Um, it is nonetheless the case, uh, as I understand it, that you know nature is the best healer in the sense that, I mean, I've just recently um, been reading around uh, the whole issue of deforestation, reforestation, and so on. You know, there is no better cure than leaving forests standing. Mm -hmm. Replacing forests is mm -hmm. not the same as leaving forests standing because it is not just about the trees. It is about the entire ecosystem and how it interacts with the water system. And someone like Carlos Nobre talking about the Amazon, for example, will highlight exactly that. Um, so we need to learn that it's not good enough to just say, well, we can cut down here and, and, and plant again there. You know, that we actually have to stop um, cutting down old growth forests. So that, that's when quite the tour de force, really, a very um, swift run through six months of the year um, in, in 30 minutes or so flat. So, but before we go, though, I think it's important to reflect on a couple of things. Firstly, the uh, ecoside.com website, your sister website that you wanted to mention? Ecosidelaw.com. Yes, that's right. That's our sister site, which focuses on the sort of historic, legal and academic aspects around ecocide law. Um, and it's co-managed by the Promise Institute of Human Rights, which is part of the UCLA um, School of Law, uh, and also the Human Rights Consortium from the School of Advanced Studies at the University of London. Um, and we've got some news uh, on that site recently because we've just launched um, a symposium there or the, the uh, pro proceedings from um, a symposium that was held at the Promise Institute. The number of papers uh, on the theme of you know, criminalizing ecocide and new perspectives on that. So um, really worth going and having a look at that. There are also going to be podcasts um, with the various authors um, of those papers. Um, so that's something to, to go and, and, and follow and investigate, looking at all sorts of different aspects of the law. Um, so that's, that's literally just launched last week. And we've also had some interesting ways that people have been drawing attention to the initiative. And the most lovely one that has been going on actually for the last year, but is, is nearing its conclusion, is a fantastic, well, we might call it a pilgrimage perhaps, um, that's, been, um, that's been engaged in by a, a wonderful woman called Zoe Bika. Um, who has been trekking the length of the UK from Oxford to Loch Lomond, which is where Polly Higgins, our co-founder, grew up, and back down again in the company of a mule called Falco, who has been carrying her you know, worldly goods, if you like, um, on his back um, and walking with her. Um, and she has done that to bring attention to the Stop Ecoside movement and to raise funds for... Um, for our work, um, and she's been stopping off and speaking with communities and schools along the way um, around protecting the earth and around the um, around the ecocide law initiative. Um, so that's been a really um, amazing trip. Um, I mention it now because she passed. She, she's, she's actually just been the last few days spending time in Stroud, which is where. The, uh, where the campaign originally began back in 2017 and where I'm still based. Um, and it was, it, you know, it really felt like a sort of a homecoming, even though she hadn't started off from Stroud, she started from Oxford. But actually meeting her, walking through the woods after you know, 800 plus miles of this incredible journey was really quite an emotional moment. Um, and that's, that's been a really lovely thing to do. And she's also, alongside that, been doing a, a kind of a textiles project called Interwoven, um, which is a kind of commu community contributions to a, a textile art piece, um, which I believe is destined for a presentation to Vanuatu, uh, from one island community to another. So really beautiful way of linking the, the, the grassroots to the high-level developments in this, in this really lovely story that that has been to tell so that's been really beautiful it is it's a really really nice um story to end on which which i think puts us in a place where we can ask genuinely what calls to action do you have are there are there things that people can do that help the cause that move things forward as individuals absolutely and i think zoe's is is an example of a really unusual and brave and and imaginative way to really do that and bring attention to the to uh, the campaign and of course you know there are many ways to support this initiative it doesn't have to be that you trek a thousand miles with a mule um, although of course if you want to do that I'm sure Zoe would be very happy to talk to you um, 
But for example, I mean, what really supports us in a really basic way are simple, even if they're quite small, monthly donations. Um, and actually, as I say, the momentum that we've been gathering over the last sort of few months, I think, should be, you know, strong proof, if you like, that this is, you know, this is, this is a horse that's really running, you know, this is, and, and it's one to back. So if you can manage to do that, it would make a huge difference to this work. It would really help to move things forward in a very concrete way. Um, and that can be done on our website through donations. That can also be done by joining the campaign as a member. We call our members Earth Protectors. Um, and that's another way to, to, to support and funds from that are specifically geared towards the diplomatic progress. Um, so that's also a really important way that you can assist. And of course, as I always say, the one thing you can always do, as well as everything else, is talk about ecocide. There is something about this word that has its internal momentum and is really pushing the dial internationally. So keep talking about it with your friends, your family, your networks. We all have them, big and small. So yeah, use the word ecocide and stay tuned. Excellent. No, thank you very much for that, Jojo. It's a great place to end. Um, until next time, thank you very much. You've been listening to the Ecoside Report. You can find out more about all of the issues discussed in this episode via the links in the podcast description. Thanks so much for listening and see you next time.